Okay, so this is part two from um, last week. Last week we got all the way into the balls and into the period of darkness. But just by a real quick, real quick review, um, we know we've, we've gotten to the point here now where it's going to be all about um, Babylon and the destruction of Babylon. And that's going to also go into chapter 17 and chapter 18. And this is all the realm of the Antichrist, um, also known as the beast at this point. Because remember, the Antichrist is not called the beast until we get into Revelation chapter 12 and 13. And then what happened in Revelation 12 and 13? Remember, Satan was kicked out of heaven, came down, possessed the Antichrist, and now he's known as the beast. That's why in that one chart, I had indicated with, with the little circles and the lines and drawing, connecting the dots of who's who and everything. I was calling him on that chart the Antichrist beast because it's the Antichrist now possessed by Satan, so he's the beast. So this is his system here that's um, falling under attack. Um, now, last week we, I raised some weird questions and read a couple of strange verses. Um, and uh, did anybody have any questions about that before we get ready to go on to the sixth bowl with the Euphrates drying up and then getting into Armageddon? Okay, so then um, resuming from last week then, in the bowls, the sixth bowl is um, the Euphrates dries up. If I can. So it says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, let's back up again. We saw you, we've been seeing the Euphrates come up pretty regularly, right? Kind of strange ways and ways that are tied to dark spiritual forces and things. Um, one of the ways we saw Euphrates before too was um, strange creatures coming up from the Euphrates. And um, we also saw this in, in um, the book of Daniel as well. And here and there in the scriptures, including in the Old Testament, you see these Euphrates connections come up. So now here it is again. Um, what folks will often do, and, and I believe we've covered this almost maybe too much, when you get into Revelation chapter 9, it mentions the army of 200 million, and then folks will take that passage, because it's about the Euphrates, and then they'll come over here to... Revelation 16, and grab the sixth bowl here with the Euphrates drying up, and then the announcement or the pronouncement of the kings up from the east coming, and throw them all together, and kind of kind of do the Hal Lindsey thing and say, oh, let's do a mashup then of these two and say 200 million is China's army. So they'll do the Hal Lindsey thing newspaper exegesis, go in and say, wow, you know, let me look this up. Look, China's boasting a, a, a land army of 200 million. So there must be China coming over and crossing the Euphrates, and that's what this is. When I want to say that it, it doesn't say that, does it mean that China's not coming? No, it doesn't mean that. But I'm just saying we've got to be careful not to jump those kinds of conclusions. Kings of the East, Probably China, probably North Korea, who knows. Let's hop back real quick, though, and re-examine this because it's kind of related. Remember the bowl of darkness in Babylon? It says, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. So wherever the beast's throne is, 
And uh, it says Babylon, so you know what? I'm going to take it to mean Babylon. I don't take it to mean necessarily that Babylon moved. Can Babylon move and, and to have a headquarter somewhere else? Sure, it can, but um, it doesn't. It doesn't really say that. So I'm going to just take it on face value. Can the Antichrist within five or six years build up Babylon and make it some great place? You know, we saw what Saddam Hussein did, and he had a lot of it already built up. So, and it, you know, for museum reasons and tourism reasons and things like that, the Iraqis have been hard at work with the help of um, the United Nations and other funding organizations rebuilding what what uh, Saddam Hussein started and even taking it further, going through these plants, trying to restore everything after the Iraqi wars. So Babylon is kind of going under some construction right now anyway. So anyway, it says Babylon, his, his, his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongue because of the pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their, de of their deeds. So then, do you recall, I read the, the strange thing in Joel chapter 2 about this uh, strange army that comes from the north. And um, if you, as you recall, it reads kind of weird, but this is during the time of darkness. And some people will try to read this and say that, hey, this is the same event. This is the kings of the east coming over. So just to reiterate what this says, it says in Joel 2, um, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on the holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people, so far so good, a great and powerful people coming, but then it get to, takes a weird turn here. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. Now you could maybe make an argument that their like has never been before, nor will be again after them. It could be, you could say maybe because of their behavior, because of their great number or something. I guess you could try to make that argument. It's, it's uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 is what we're looking at. Because it says this, too, and it, and it sounds familiar. It sounds like the horde, the demonic horde, again, tied to the Euphrates in, in Revelation chapter 9, where it says um, in verse 4, their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. Does that sound like a Chinese... Army? Do they look like horses? I mean, I don't usually think of them as horse faces. <laughs> you know, so it says their appearance, or not they were, they were riding on horses, or whatever it says, their appearance is like the appearance of horses. So that was my question, is this, is this the 200 million that went out upon the earth, however far they went, this demonic horde from chapter 9, this other world, and now this is them coming back, and now they're moving in on Jerusalem. So that's my question. Um, verse 5, as with rumbling of chariots, they leap up on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before then peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall, they march each on his way. They did not swerve from their path. They did not jostle one another. So they're very organized. See, each marches on his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. Verse 9, they leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun's and moon are darkened, probably because of all the flames and fire and all the dust they're kicking up, um, and the stars withdraw their shining. 
So that was the weird thing where we strange the strange thing where we left off, but that's the fifth bowl, the darkness and and uh it's during this darkness that this kind of thing happens according to Joel. But we don't have that until the very next trumpet. Here we've got Euphrates um dried up. So I'll make this larger. Can you see okay that map? where the Euphrates is, and see how large it is. Now, now, the purpose tonight isn't to go into all the history and story of the Euphrates and give you all the statistics about how big it is and how, you know, it's one of the largest rivers in the world and all that kind of stuff. But if you look, you see where it runs, and it divides that land pretty thoroughly. To the far left over there, you see Lebanon down into Israel and uh, over by the Mediterranean Sea. So the Euphrates blocks off between Syria and Iraq. There you see Saudi Arabia to the, bo to the bottom. But notice just on the other side, about midway through, just on the other side of the Euphrates is Babylon. So I think there's significance there because if you've got, if, if you want to take a literal view and say that the throne of the king of Babylon is actually in Babylon, then that would kind of make sense. Yeah, so they dry it up. There is a dam there. But here's the other part that happens. This is kind of interesting. And we read about these unclean spirits. And that's what I mean about these armies during the darkness before. And then we come to this part where Euphrates is dried up and then and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast. So um, the dragon is Satan. And it says out of the mouth of the dragon and the mouth of the beast. So I think what he's saying is that we know the beast gets his power. We've read before. He gets his power and his authority from Satan, right? He can't do it on his own. So this is the Antichrist, the Antichrist beast. Um, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we've... Um, got this false trinity and we see these unclean spirits going forth unclean spirits like frogs for their demonic spirit spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of god the almighty i put grays in here just because you know when so many people have seen these demonic um, spirits that they think are aliens and maybe benevolent spirits coming and uh, it's a possibility that the Antichrist might try to rally these around and say yes they're here to help too these are good creatures yes there is life on other planets and yes they did take a lot of people away and then use this to kind of explain the rapture you know as many people have discussed and it's a possibility conjecture means nothing at all that I have this this picture up here we, we have these three demonic spirits to send out that are uh, out upon the whole world and if he's already kind of possibly tied himself to them in some way in the past and I thought well it'll be interesting at least to put the imagery in here that he's got these unclean spirits he sends out to all the world so it isn't even until this point that these unclean spirits like frogs he sends out to the world uh, the frogs and the unclean spirits thing is, is something else that comes from the Old Testament. You see this related a lot. And um, it's not surprising. We know the, the frogs in the Exodus passage. Exodus 8, 6, it says, um, So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And part of the reason why is because the Egyptians were worshiping. It was one of their gods was frogs. Well, once again, God is using, oh, you like frogs? <laughs> have some frogs uh, and same kind of thing here because remember they, they kept um, these demonic things keep happening on the earth and these woes and so forth and then they cease from repenting in uh, Revelation chapter 9 that's probably the Gentiles no more repenting from the Gentiles than we just read earlier in this chapter um, that could include probably includes the Jews that remained behind they quit repenting, and so and they keep going forth in worshiping the dragon, worshiping the beast. So God's saying, "Oh, so you like unclean spirits? So you like the beast?" So 
uh, idiomatic again of demons, and they're always associated with Euphrates, it seems like. Um, so these demons go out. Now, it says they go to the kings of the whole world. Now, uh, not specifically by name or what country, but who are the kings of the whole world again? Remember the ten horns we have? In the, so we got seven heads and ten horns, or the ten toes in the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Again, to reiterate, um, you have these animals that were presented early on, and John is saying that the Antichrist is coming, in his kingdom that's coming, it's like these animals, except these animals, he refers back to Daniel, the vision that Gabriel gave Daniel about three actual kings who would come up and live and, and run these countries. You know, you had um, Babylon, you had Medo-Persia, you had Greece, you had Rome. So these are actual countries, except what John is saying, the difference is, is that, yeah, you got these three different countries and or four different countries and these four different kings. Ultimately, you have um, ten horns. Um, you have seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads, um, there's very little argument that the seven heads could mean the seven different kingdoms that have been in the past, and we'll see in the next chapter that one was and one isn't anymore and so forth. These were actual kingdoms, and they started off with... Um, who is it? Egypt, Medo-Persia. I know I'm going to miss something. Egypt, uh, Medo-Persia, Babylon. Yeah, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And uh, Rome was, and it's not anymore, and it is again. Also, so we got, you know, there's arguments whether it's it's going to be, you know, whether Rome is part of it or Assyria is the one that was and isn't anymore. So people will argue whether that's Rome or whether it's Assyria. A lot of people argue that Rome never really went away, so it's a Syria that was and isn't anymore. So, but what John's the point John's trying to make about these seven heads or these seven kingdoms is that just like the kingdoms that went in the past, where he was talking about the leopard and the bear and all this, the Antichrist in his domain is like this, except it's all of these wrapped up into one. So I think that's the point John's trying to make. So you got seven heads. But they're now. Yeah, the dragon is Satan. So Satan is behind all of these kingdoms and forces in the past. All of these kingdoms in the, in the past, they had Israel enslaved. And guess what? They're enslaved again here at this point. And uh, so God's going to have to come and rescue them. So in the past, they were one at a time, one kingdom at a time, one king at a time. Yes, this is what it's going to be like. John's trying to explain that well, what I'm seeing here in this vision is this is all bundled up into one. It's a one world government. And it keeps talking about, and, and the way we know this too, is that it talks, it keeps talking about the whole world or the whole earth. So we, we know, yes, there's a, a seat where Antichrist beast is going to have his headquarters. I think probably really Babylon. Some people will swear up and down. It's um, in Europe somewhere. Um, you know, it, um, I guess that part of it doesn't really matter, but the point is, is that it's global. So this is what's coming down. So the unclean spirits, they go out to the kings of the earth, of, of the whole world, and that is the ten horns. That is the ten kings, his prefix, his co-rulers with him. So we've already seen that um, how he came up and the couple were devoured, and now he came up, he was the little horn. And now he, he runs everything. So, um, for they are demonic spirit. Let me try that again. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world. So notice they go abroad. So they're going overseas. Just to reiterate that it's not just the, like, sometimes you saw Rome rule the whole world. Well, Rome ruled what was the civilized world at the time, what they knew as the whole world. This is describing they go abroad. It literally is the whole world. It literally is the whole earth. And so it's to show that it, it's more inclusive than first century, for instance. So he goes there to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So we know when Christ returns, the great day of God the Almighty... When he comes down to trample the grapes of wrath, 
what is going on in Israel at that time? Well, if all the people are in Petra, then nasty stuff's going on in Israel. It is. And, and only the elect true are in Petra. You got half of Jerusalem stayed behind, half of, or um, two thirds of um, the rest of Israel stayed but behind. Nothing good going but nothing good's going on, but the armies have already assembled. Remember for Armageddon, yeah. they're already there in the area. So we're looking at we're looking at the staging of Armageddon. So what happens here is these demonic creatures are stirring up. Now these armies were staging in the area, and they've probably been there for a while. And they keep they've been amassing, they've been amassing and amassing. So now they're in the area, and now these demonic spirits are are going to go, and they're going to encourage them to bring more more forces. I don't know how long this takes for all this to happen between the sixth bowl. And the um, seventh bowl, but there's got to be a little bit of time for them to the last of their uh, forces to amass. So, very likely, what's what's going on is um, there's a lot, maybe demonic possession. So, just as you know, no question that Hitler was possessed. No question that Alexander the Great was possessed. Some of these great kings were possessed. These guys are possessed, and these spirits are now, they're calling them and their armies all to amass. The intention of these spirits, though, is, is no longer um, to go after God's city and his people, per se, not necessarily directly, right? Now these spirits know that the time is really short and that the Messiah is getting ready to come, so they're ready to... Um, turn upon the Son of Man when he shows up in heaven. And ultimately, it'd be kind of a joke, they might try that, but, um, you know, it's it's not going to end well. Now, we keep seeing this phrase about, um, I'm going to come upon you like a thief. Let's re-examine that real quick, just to, um, a, a word from our sponsor, and now a word about coming like a thief. Because... There is this persistent um, idea that coming like a thief, um, when God is proclaiming, I'm going to come upon you like a thief, true, he's talking judgment. But God coming like a thief for those he's judging means also coming like a thief is good news for us. And why is that? Why would that be? Because when is the day of the Lord? When is that period, that era start, starts at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, right? Just like um, judgment was from Noah, so God's judgment for Noah, or for the world at that time, to flood the whole world and kill everybody was, turned out to be good news for Noah and family because they were on the ark, they were hidden on the ark, God brought the animals in, he closed the door and and there was above it, or you could look at it like, um, and that's if you liken Noah to Israel. So he takes them through it just like they're going through in uh, Petra, Moab, Edom, that whole area out there, bringing them through it. Enoch was taken up like the church was raptured before even Noah. So, behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on that day that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. First Thessalonians 5, chapters, verses 2 to 4, that the day of the Lord would come like a thief. He said, you're fully aware. And then he contrasts day and night and says, that day will surprise those in darkness. Remember, he keeps using that us and them language. That does not mean the event means the second coming. Because here's the thing. By what reasoning? The passage in context that Paul is talking about, starting in chapter 4 and going into chapter 5, is all about the rapture. In chapter 4, there was the rapture, and then Paul explains it in chapter 4. In fact, the Hebrew wedding, wedding tradition, it's about the bride herself, who is taken by the bridegroom, often at midnight, as a thief. 
So the event is the taking, for the bride is taken um, as a thief to the father of the groom's house, where she's hidden for seven days in celebration. Does that make sense? So it all happens beforehand. That's not going to happen at the second coming. That doesn't make sense then. Like a thief in the night applies to those in darkness, just as judgment did to those in darkness during the flood. They were caught completely unaware, and then judgment, right? That's what it says. It is not judgment, then like a thief. The surprise is prior to judgment. So the foolish virgins, even, in that parable, it's the same kind of thing. They were caught unprepared before the wedding, not after the wedding's done. So like a thief has to do with rapture, that time, and the world is caught by surprise like a thief, not the church. But you who stayed awake watching, like we're watching, keeps his garment. That means his righteousness, because we're there on, that he may not go about making a deceit. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that's like the parable of the father having the wedding, and the people he invited didn't come, and at one point there was a man there mm -hmm. with a dress. It's like, how'd you get in here? Yeah. Yeah. So these passages do address the unrepentant. Those passages do address those in darkness, but they're all prior to the judgment, not after the judgment. A thief doesn't do as the Lord did in Daniel 9, or um, and in Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, and say, I'm going to be at your place at exact, in exactly three and a half years. Isn't that what he does in, in um, Daniel 9? And then in, in Revelation, same thing in Revelation chapters 11, 12, and 13. He says, I'm going to be there in three and a half years, or a time, times, and half a time. I'm going to be there in 42 months. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a thief. I'm going to break into your place in 1260 days. That's not what a thief does. And then show up with thunder and lightnings and a massive entourage on horseback. That's not thief-like. So that's second coming. That's after the fact. Like a thief in the night is about the rapture in that it is the bride of the bridegroom that is taken. I like this quote from Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry um, noted that the pearl of great price, that the, this is another parable there, that the merchant sold already had to purchase it. It's the church. That's the pearl of great price. The bride of Christ purchased with his very own blood. So the thief is Christ coming to take that pearl of great price out of the earth, his bride. Then, just as the loss of Noah's day, judgment comes. Jesus said his coming would be just like that. Is that clear now? Any more questions on that? So, the Lord is coming thief-like, but and that's bad news for the unrepentant, but that's good news for church, and it's, that means it's rapture and not second coming. Yes? So he's, so he's restating this at this point as just a reminder of that's you're, you're blessed if you you don't have to go through this. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what if you're, if you're If you're... If you have your garments on, in other words, not just any old garments, but your white robe, you know, purity, you're, you're washed in the lamb. Uh, the bride's, the, the um, bride's garments, she's dressed in white, she's made herself pure. She's ready to go. The uh, bridegroom comes, she's dressed and she's ready to go and take off with the entourage and go away. So this verse 15 is just a snippet of... Yeah. Right? Yeah, of Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not, may not go about naked and uh, be seen exposed. So what he's doing, now why would this be up in chapter 16, is he's saying, okay, this time that I've told you about before, this is it. And now he's saying, blessed is the one who stays awake, um, those folks are gone because he's already said nobody else is repenting. So those are the people in uh, Petra. That's about it. And maybe some survivors hanging out, hiding out in caves who might make it. 
you know, here and there, some other, some other saints, some other believers here and there in the world who've managed to find a cubby hole to, to hide in or something. Um, because those right now are like they're going about naked and they're about to be exposed. So this is the warning to them that this time I told you about, hey, blessed are the ones that made it out. So it's almost a proclaim. Like it's a proclamation. It's a re because it, it's right. It is a restatement. He's already been saying this all along. He keeps saying it all along, and then here it's like you know that time I told you about, like a thief. You know, this is you know you're caught exposed. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a proclaiming of what already happened. Yeah, it's or in the process of. So there's a lot of that in the process of happening right now. So for um, people who are pre-mill. Um, post-trib, uh, uh, is that one of the arguments that they use for that? Uh, I don't know that I've heard them make that like a thief argument. They're, they could if they, there are a lot of pre-trib pre-mills who think like, I'm coming like a thief means because it has to do with the day, 24 hour day, that period there, whatever day that is that Jesus returns, it refers to that. As we've gone through, that's an era. The day of the Lord is also the whole tribulation period. Sometimes the day of the Lord is the day of his wrath, and it's just the second half, and it's the great tribulation. But it's also in some places a day that's a specific day, not just that day as in generally that era where all this stuff happens. And we know a lot of times that day is an era because he'll mention a lot of things that happen that are, we've been reading about that take more than just a 24-hour day to happen and to stage and to set up. So sometimes he's talking about, sometimes that day includes everything from, in that day, I'm going to bring you out of the mountains, out of the hills, out of the nations. I'm going to bring you back into your land. In that day, I'm going to heal your land. And it was a, it'll be a desert, but when you come back into it, it won't be a desert anymore. In that day, I'm going to do, and he starts talking about things that happen um, that are, you know, the um, temple has to be built between the time he's bringing them out of all the countries and out of all of the, these nations into a desert land. And that only can be 1948 because no more can anybody come back and find a desert to inhabit and things. So that time was 1948. Part of that process is we know that day is going to include hey uh, uh the antichrist is going to come and he's going to stand up in the temple and he's going to make himself to be god well, wait so between 1948 now we've made this huge leap decades up to where now we got a temple back has that happened yet no here we are as of the time i'm speaking 2022 we still don't have the temple we've got all the implements we got everything down to the chief cornerstone built prefabbed in warehouses. Everything's done. We got the Levitical priests um, trained, they're ready to go. Um, the red heifer is being seen and being um, bred and so forth. We, we, everything's ready to go. So that day is a span of history or it can be referred to the time of Jacob's trouble. So sometimes it, it'll say that time or that day. So this is an era we're talking about here, or some people would say, and it's a trigger word for some people, that dispensation. So it's a dispensation referring to specifically how God administers, that's what a dispensation is. God is administering um, the end times in a very specific way, and that's to wrap things up and set things up for the coming of the Son of Man. So every, all of this is staging of that. You see the, you've seen the stage set, the events all playing out, the people who are involved. Um, the church has been taken out. It's not mentioned anymore. Now we've got these tribulation saints. We've got these martyrs. We've got the 144,000. We've had the two witnesses. We've got the Antichrist coming in, and we've got different countries coming in. And then we've got uh, uh, the Antichrist is here, and then we've got um, demonic hordes being loosed upon the earth. We've got Satan kicked down, and Satan possesses the Antichrist. And, and now we've got this second beast who is the false prophet and he is he's going to be um you know he's all wrapped up in part of this stuff too in, in promoting this the false religion aspect of it so now we got all this come together 
And some people will say that Babylon, that's mentioned here in Revelation a lot, and it is a type. Babylon is a type because it was a, um, as a, the nature of the kingdom that it was. And we'll get into that. Uh, we'll be gone next week because of you know the holiday weekend. So we're, we won't do that. And some folks will be out barbecuing and having family time and things like that. So we'll just skip next week. But when we come back next time, chapter 17 and going into chapter 18, talking a little bit about Babylon and how the, um, Babylon comes into play here. But again, as we've read, especially in Daniel, this, this time is also not just Babylon, but it's also Rome. That's why a lot of people will marry them up and go, okay, because maybe Babylon transplants into Rome. But again, we're dealing with typology here because what was Rome like? What was Babylon like and what was Rome like? So Rome isn't really mentioned in here anymore, but it wasn't Daniel. So we're dealing in typology. Um, so we'll, we'll address some of that. So anyway, we've got Armageddon, and you could probably see the little red circle there. And, and let me, that was just real is where the Battle of Armageddon would take place. And it's just a, a, a big, it funnels down into a big galley, a big, a big valley, a big ravine. And uh, that's why blood can stand up there the way it does. So it's, it's about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. And uh, so the symbol at that place, it says in verse 16, at that place that is in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So it's the Valley of Megiddo. And you'll see this in um, a couple different locations. Here's, here's some references that you can look at if you want to and you want to see more about this location. But uh, Zephaniah, Z-E-P-H, if you want to abbreviate it, Zephaniah 3.8. 2 Chronicles 35, 22, Joshua 5, 14, and then also in Zechariah 12, Zechariah 12, 11. So all of those armies that it's discussing here are staged in the Megiddo area, and that's how they come to be there, so that by the time we get to the sixth bowl, they're all there. And then these Duonic creatures get scattered out of the earth to bring in all these armies. Possibly. So much of this is, is speculation as far as the timing of it and so forth. Does that make sense at all? We don't know how they, they connect. Some people swear that they do know how that connects, but um, I, I, you know, hey, if you got this set dialed in and you got that perfected, then great, let me know because I'm yeah. not so sure, but I'm not going to be there, so I'm not going to worry about it, huh? <clears throat> main, the main thing is, you know, yeah, there's going to be a mop up going on, so, uh, gonna do that, so. he's going to do the mop up thing, and it's going to be messy when the actual battle of Armageddon happens. Whether there'll be a nuclear war or not, I'm not real sure. There's some passages, like in Zechariah, where it talks about. Um, the things that happen to people, maybe neutron bombs and their tongues clinging to the roof, melting in the, to the roofs of their mouths, their eyes melting in their sockets and all this other kind of, sounds like neutron bomb, could be nuclear. I don't know. Um, you know, it's it's speculation, but it, it, it could very well be, it could very well go nuclear. I'm, I'm not going to say definitively that that's the case, but we're coming to the end of it here. And the seventh bowl to finally wrap it all up. And then the wrath is done. This is going to take us to the very end. And then we're going to have some parenthetic chapters. Because what's going to happen is we're going to go into chapter 17 and 18. And that's going to specifically address not the war type of ways. But specifically going to address how Babylon and Mystery Babylon falls. And a lot of people say that uh, Babylon... When it's talking about Babylon and Mystery Babylon, it's all the same thing. It's all one big system. Some people say, no, it's it's two different systems. There's the political Babylon, and then there's the religious Babylon. So there's the political, economical Babylon, and then there's the religious Babylon. Some people will say that there's the uh, political, economical type Babylon, like a country, 
But then mystery Babylon is the mystery religions. And that's so much is true. All the mystery religions, the Eastern religions all come from, they all have their roots in ancient Babylon. So that much is true too. So we could talk about that more in a couple of weeks and maybe you could do a little reading beforehand and you can um, contribute your thoughts and ideas on it, what you found, and that might be helpful. So it's the seventh bowl. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple. This is what's been happening right from the temple in heaven. The loud voice, which is God, from the throne saying, it is done. Now that it is done is a little bit different from when Jesus said it is finished on the cross. It is finished on the cross. The, the term that Jesus used then was to tell us die, which had to do with the paying of a debt. Um, in other words, debt is paid in full. So this is not quite the paid in full kind of thing that, that Jesus did because that debt was paid in full that gets us out of prison forever and to eternal life. This, it is done as God's whole plan of redemption and, and um, the judgment upon the earth and all that kind of stuff. And it's more like him saying, I've had enough. <laughs> so you see the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and there's speculation that why did this bowl get poured out into the air? We, re we read in the epistles concerning Satan that this was his realm. He's the prince of the power of the air, right? So his reach goes all the way into what you call the first heaven, the air we breathe. Ephesians 5. Somewhere up in there. So we, we but um, the air literally, okay, could be because it's a fallen earth, but also in that other dimension. So whatever influence upon the earth, that's all Satan. So maybe this judgment is poured out into the air because it's a specific message to send to Satan. Ephesians 2.2, 2, I think is what that is, Hillary. 2-2, two, two, not 5-2. I, I was wrong. Yeah. It happens once in a while. And I've been known to be wrong once or twice, too. So it's finished. Here it's different. Um, and, and then it says, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Not exactly, again, not exactly the way a thief comes to make an announcement that He's on his way, right? Thieves don't usually make an announcement. They usually like to just show up and get out before you know they're there. So again, to, just to, just I'm trying to make that point, just trying to drive it home there. That this is uh, more of what, when the temple in heaven is mentioned with the very end in these judgments, we keep seeing this the rumblings and thunder and stuff. This is the wrath of God. And this is him growling and rumbling and shaking his fist, as it were. So in the seventh bowl, we also have a great earthquake. Um, it says, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. Now, that's fantastic considering all the earthquakes we've been reading about so far. Because all the earthquakes we've read about so far have uh, shaken mountains and islands, moved islands, shaken um, many mountains. But this one is so great that the great city... The great city is what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of wine and fury of his wrath. And every island, every island this time, fled away. And no mountains were to be found. That's a whole lot of shaking going on. Verse 21, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. Now, they, these people kept blaspheming and they kept denying God and cursing God and they kept worshiping the dragon, right? That's blasphemy. What, what is the judgment for blasphemy in the Old Testament? Death by what? Stoning, right? So I think it's ironic that God hears through stoning great hail stones the size of a man and he's these are being hurled to the earth. About 100 pounds each fell to the earth, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed, they kept, they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So, again, notice that the flashes of lightnings and rumblings, peals of thunder that had been in the heavens before and coming out of the throne, 
associated with the bowls. They were in heaven, but now it's like those flashes of thunder and lightning and things are now, and the quaking is now upon the earth. So all of that is God's rumblings and things now are all concentrating down to the earth. So they curse God. So they still must believe there was God. Yeah. Was it like, I wonder if there was agnostic people around. <laughs> no, probably not many. No. God, I mean, they... they just persist and persist and persist, and they they persist in worshiping the dragon, worshiping you know. As we all would be without the Holy Spirit. I mean, they cannot yeah. come to Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, and and that's what we read from Scripture. Right? A lot of people don't like that, and that's not politically correct in some churches. But... It's, it's in they're incapable of. Worshiping God unless they are called. Then, uh, this is the thing: is that is that if if begging and pleading on the altar, and everybody come forward, raise your hand. I want to see that hand. Everybody come forward. Come down to the altar. Come up here and pray. Y'all need to repent now. If all that kind of stuff, that pleading and cajoling, is is going to be enough to get people to repent, you would think that this stuff would do it, right? right. But, but you exercise your free will. What's funny is they don't just think it's nature. I mean, they, they think it's God. Exactly, they, that's true. Then they know there's God. Yeah. Like, why don't they just... No, that does not say in the scripture at all. Not one time does it say they were all cursing global warming. Yeah. Well, it's, a gift. it's a gift from God. Or none of us can. I'm not being critical of that. I mean, none of us are able to without the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we're all dead in trespasses and sins. Is there a difference between cursing God and blaspheming God? No, I mean, it's, the one goes with the other. Because a, a curse is blasphemy. Well, like, people will say, like, O and D. They'll say, why do you believe in God? So. Well, um, using, using um, what we call euphemistically um, curse words, I think it started being called that probably. Um, you know, maybe in, I, I'm, I know I read about this at some point. I want to see merry old England centuries ago, but they call it curse words because it's all using God's name in vain. So that's where it really goes back to the Ten Commandments. You're not necessarily cursing God, shaking your fist and using, you know, a bad word against him. You look at cursing, um, using God's name in vain. Vain means what? Empty. So you're saying it for no good reason. So um, when it's not necessarily true. Now, when a prophet in the Old Testament was saying, you know, I don't get your hackles up, but when somebody is saying, you know, God damn you, the, the prophets meant it and it was not in vain. And bad things happen to those people. Most of the time, God himself just did it. And the ground opened up and swallowed people like false prophets and false priests or or uh, the prophets of Baal, um, of Elijah, and fire came down from heaven. So God usually just did it himself. So using God's name in vain is for an empty reason. And think of how often people use OMG or... Um, or use the whole phrase, or just say, oh, gee, you know, whatever. Um, some people will say, even say, oh, gee, like, gee whiz, is the same thing, because that's euphemistic for God. So you can, the intent of your heart's one thing, but we not we need to be very careful, this is why this is a great question, especially for Christians, because we're a little too casual and too friendly with old buddy Jesus. And Jesus is not old buddy. Because he comes to you and says, oh, please, call me your brother. Call me your friend. It's like, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. You know, he's God. He's almighty God. So we're too casual very often in our approach to Christ, in our approach to worship in every possible way. So using God's name in vain uh, might not be cursing God in uh, any literal sense like what the the pilgrims and the Puritans and stuff might have come up with, but it's using God's name in vain. So I think they can kind of go hand in hand depending on what you're saying and what you're doing.
from a Kabbalah spirit, the blasphemy means the denying of the Holy Spirit, and that's why that was the one unforgivable sin, because if you denied that there was a Holy Spirit, obviously then you were not going to ask for Jesus. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is an all blasphemy, but that's one of them. But the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit um, would be, um, as many theologians say, is, is to, deny, to deny his ministry to his, what is his ministry. We're told in Matthew that he convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So you, everybody has a conscience. You have to burn out your conscience to um, to not have one. And some people have done that. You know, according to what we read in Corinthians. So the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is he's the one who convicts. Even in your in your makeup, you have a conscience. Where where Paul made that argument in the first couple chapters of Romans, right? Is that everybody was without excuse. Even the even the you know Watusi out in the middle of the jungle somewhere who never heard the gospel, they are without excuse, Paul said, because they know from very creation around them that they should be able to see that there is a creator, somebody to be worshipped, and so you shouldn't, you know, shouldn't deny him. And, and um, so they're without excuse. So everybody um, is without excuse. The Bible also says that if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those who are lost, only the goats. The gospel is not hidden to any sheep. Now, what out of all this bad news, and I'll leave this on a bad note, we're going to wrap this up here. But um, the good news is, is what comes out of this, we're, we're going to get into the next two chapters about Babylon and the fall of Babylon. But in chapter 19, look at look in verse 11. Here comes Christ on a white horse. Verse 12. This is how he comes back. His eyes are a flame of fire. His head has many crowns. He has a name written on him which no man can know except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. So John uh, presumably here is still on the Holy Mount or within sight of the Holy Mount. Maybe he's around Jerusalem. So meanwhile, as we will get into Christ makes a big loop when he comes back down toward uh, actually he makes a loop he starts off down there toward the Moab area Petra and he takes out those armies and we see in the Old Testament where the ground melts in front of him and blood flies up and is getting on his road um, because he's wiping out those armies who got uh, the saints in Petra surrounded and would like to take them out so he gets there first and he circles around and he goes around to the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Decision, Jezreel, and he wipes all them out. So then by the time he comes around here for the second coming where his foot touches down on the Mount of Olives, his, his robe is dipped in blood by this point. So this is what John is describing here. His name is called the Word of God. Remember John is saying, I wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is that Word. John likes to tell him. Tell us about the word. He uses the same language in 1 John too. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations. So at a word, he's going to be saying this. And it's going to be sharp words. And this is how, literally where you get the term sharp words, because of the mouth that comes out of like a sword out of his mouth, the things he says. So that's how the war ends. He smites them, he rules them with a rod of iron, and he smashes out the, the winepress of his fierce, the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, his um, name is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, and the victory is so complete that um, the birds which fly in, the, in, the, in mid heaven, uh, the sky, in other words, are, are a symbol for a great supper. Most of them are buzzards, I'm sure, to eat the flesh of kings and, and commanders and mighty men and horses and those who sit on them and uh, the flesh of all men, free men and slaves, small and great, doesn't matter what class they are, they all die the same way. Uh, all, the, all the goats, all the unbelievers. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies assembled to make war against him, not against Israel now because of the beast, these 
demons went out now and persuaded them to turn their guns on him. So they make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The, pe the beast was seized. With him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest, remember that phrase, the rest, because we're into the rest in Revelation chapter 20. The rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat upon the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh, and an angel came down from heaven, having the key to the abyss, a chain in his hand, they hold of the dragon, Satan, because Satan probably at this point tried to flee and leave the beast, right? The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire into the first residence there. And Satan's going to sneak out, so he leaves. He's possessing the, the, um, the beast, the Antichrist, anymore. So the serpent of old, Satan himself now is grabbed, and he's bound for a thousand years, and um, he's thrown into the abyss, sealed and shut so that he can't deceive, so he couldn't deceive the nations any longer till the thousand years was over. So there's the first time we have mentioned about the thousand years, and then in chapter 20, he keeps repeating thousand over and over. So all together with this, and in chapter 20, I think we've got seven times thousand is, is mentioned, because you get six times, I believe, in Revelation chapter 20. So Revelation chapter 19, right here, and then in chapter 20. So seven times God mentions the thousand years. So this is how things wrap, wrap up. I mean, it seems like a dark thing, but, you know, God is a just God. He's a holy God. He is a loving God. He, he loves his, his lambs. He loves his sheep. He loves us. And that he must meet out judgment because he's a holy and righteous God. And now, um, as we start getting into it, he's going to establish his, uh, all the promises of his kingdom and his kingdom on earth. And he's going to occupy the throne of David as Gabriel promised or assured Mary that he would sit on the throne of David. And, um, and he's going to rule there. So we'll get there and um, maybe three or four weeks uh, from now, we'll see how that goes. But we're coming up on the end. We're creeping up on the very end. And this is, this is God, his plan of redemption playing out. And this is part of the great wrap up at the very end. Any, any more questions about any of that? Some great questions. And the good thing about cursing God is that it's a great question to blast me. Where are those lines? And again, we as saints need to be conscious and aware of that, more careful about it, and cautious. And caution to their brothers and sisters in Christ, not in a condemning way necessarily, but at first kind of, at least the first time, kind of pull them aside and saying, hey, you know what that OMG thing means, right? And how it's using God's name in vain and what God thinks of that. God thinks so strongly about that that he actually made that one of his commandments not to do that so all right let's close in prayer and then we can continue to discuss father thank you so much for what you've shown us in your word with we're, we're so thankful that we're going to miss all this stuff and how some people can come to the conclusion that yeah the church is going to go through that it's it's absurd God, because we're the bride of Christ, that you would to think that you would toss hundred pound hail on your bride and and give the, your bride nothing but blood to drink, and give your bride great earthquakes that take a lot of people out, and and it's just uh, it, it's a crazy thing to believe. Um, Lord, we we know we live in trouble sometimes now, but they're nowhere near what it's going to be. And we pray for those. Uh, who don't know you, Lord, that you would call them to yourselves. And uh, Lord, we all have loved ones we care about. You know who they are. What names and faces come to our, our minds right now as we pray. We pray for those, God, that you would call them to yourself and uh, embrace them as your sheep. And even as we pray this, God, we know that you won't lose even one as you've you've said, you've, you've assured us in 
the Gospel of John. Again, the same writer, he records that um, you will not lose one of who the Father has given you. So Lord Jesus, we pray, even so come quickly. Amen.